Uh, today we continue on for a second week with uh, the reading of Vindicia Contra Tyrannos, uh, an anonymous work of the uh, 16th century. As we talked about last week, it, it captured and uh, directed the popular uh, unification in response to the, the horrors of uh, Huguenot persecution. Uh, the, the state in France launched a terrible wave of persecution against Reformed Christians in, in France. And uh, we want to, to bore into it today after a short introduction and look at some of the biblical arguments. Naturally enough, the microphone works, but now the, the clicker, clicker doesn't. Remember where we, we, we are. Uh, we're basically a, a century in uh, to the, the Reformation through this, this time uh, lapsed here. We've read the confession of the pastors at the siege of, of Magdeburg which is 1550, which is the real uh, birth of the, the first uh, Christian efforts at a, a public doctrine of the right of, of resistance to lawful authorities, uh, relying on the principle of the rights of lesser magistrates to intervene between the people and a wrongful ruler. This, of course, comes to a, a head, as we, we looked at before, as a persecution begins in uh, the open skirmishing in 1570. We've previously looked at the work of John Knox, where we saw the beginnings of a new idea, which was instead of relying simply on the agency of a intervening ruler between a higher ruler and the people, the question emerged, what are the duties of the people themselves with respect to an unjust ruler? Can the people have agency? And Knox was looking at prophecies by Jeremiah that said, it's not just the rulers that will be held accountable if they allow idolatry in their midst. It will also be the people, the people as a corporation, the people as a, an entity with personality capable of acting, capable of being morally responsible, spiritually responsive to, to God. After the uh, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, uh, and after the months of rolling violence that spread throughout France that killed tens of thousands of French Protestants, uh, it took some time for the work that we're considering today to be, to be written. And I, I don't want to give the impression that it was written solely in response to the, the horror of the situation, because it was written some time later. It was written actually after the, the horror had, had passed, and the political situation was more balanced. It was really written in an effort to redirect, the, and it did redirect, the whole course of Protestant thought about resistance away from responding to the wrongdoing of rulers. Previously, if you had to summarize what had been going on, the triggering event for the duties of people to resist was wrongdoing. What, what brought the right of resistance into effect was wrongdoing. And it might be the, the most interesting principle of the Vindicia Contra Tyrannos. Uh, you can call it legal remedies against tyrants. That, that's a one English translation. But people usually refer to it as the Vindicia because there are many English translations and they don't all, all go by legal remedies. So if you ever want to find it, look for Vindicia. What the Vindicia did, though, is instead of focusing on the, the wrongdoing of rulers and making the principle of resistance a purely reactive theory to evil, they placed a, a ground in goodness. They rested a theory on our duty, what we have to fulfill to God to be just. And what they said is, instead of just thinking about resistance as something that you do uh, when somebody is being especially evil, in, in, even though that's what they were in the face of, they worked out a, a theory of uh, resistance that was based upon the positive obligation of the people to do good. Once you think of the people as a moral agent, once you think of the people as a moral agent before God, and in particular, as we'll see today, once you read uh, the stories of the Bible, concerning the political history of Israel and see how the people engage in uh, political interventions in that story, 
you begin to get the idea that people aren't just reactors against evil. They have positive duties and positive capability to do good. So it's certainly true that the background, maybe if I click, it'll go, yep, there it goes. Uh, it's certainly true that the Vindicia is written in the shadow of a centralizing French state. It's certainly true that it's written in the, the face of cruel religious persecution. Of, of rulers which were indifferent to the suffering that they were, were causing. But this suffering was the occasion for people to go back to the word of God, to rethink all that had been happening in European and Protestant history up to this point, and to discover in the scriptures not just a, a right to react to evil, but a sense of the, the charge, the duty, the vocation of the people to do good. I'm going to go forward two slides. If you could help me, that would be even better. Since my clicker doesn't want to click. One more. There we go. So in doing this, remember, uh, the Vindicia is developing the, the suggestion that we got from Calvin. When we read Calvin, we saw his theory of resistance. There at the very end of the Institutes of Christian Religion, Calvin lays out a theology of, of resistance. And the beginning part of the resistance, the theory of resistance, uh, embraces the, the reading of Romans 13 that we've seen as problematic for resistance. Private people can't revolt. Your, your duty before God is to respect the divine ordination of things. Uh, if you encounter resistance and suffering, it's to bravely suffer as a martyr before, before God, to make sure that you're suffering not for evil, but for doing good. Uh, to re receive that suffering as a discipline from the Lord. But Calvin says, in, in saying these things, I speak only of private men. In, in urging uh, passive, passive suffering obedience, I speak only of private men. You'll have to advance it for me. Thank you. And remember what he says. He invokes this idea of a popular magistrate. A popular magistrate uh, refers, in, for Calvin, to people who were uh, to uh, leaders, the ephors, uh, the tribunes of the Roman government, people who were directly representing the people. They were chosen by the people. They were chosen from out of the people, uh, and they represented the people against the government. When popular magistrates have been appointed to curb the tyranny of kings, where there is an institution which has been created specifically to address the problem of tyranny, then these people are far from commanded not to intervene, Calvin says. To the contrary, if you advance the slide, to the contrary, these people, one more slide. There you go. To the contrary, if these people, the elected representatives of the people, connive at kings, they become complicit through their inaction. When the kings tyrannize and insult the humbler of the people, I affirm that their negligence is not free from shameful treachery because they fraudulently betray the liberty of the people. It's fraud because as the people's elected representative to curb tyranny, they're guardians who have an accounting to make. And they deceive the people by holding themselves out of the people's representative, and then they defraud the people of what's due to them. They say, I'm for you people, I'm your representative, but when it comes time to shield them from the rulers, they lie passive and let the tyrant destroy the people. It's fraud, it's a betrayal of a fiduciary trust a guardianship. They know that by the ordinance of God, they are its anointed guardians, the people's anointed guardians. Why? Because he's talking about Romans 13. Why are magistrates sent? Are magistrates sent to connive at injustice? Are magistrates sent to shut their eyes to the destruction of the people? No. Magistrates are, are meant to be God's agent of wrath 
against injustice. And so if they're sent by the people to do this thing, if they are lifted up by God's hand to be uh, magistrates for the people and they fail to do this thing, then they are defrauding the people, although they are appointed by God to be guardians. Now, so far he said there were kingdoms where this office existed. And now he advances the thesis one part. And this is the conjecture we talked about. Calvin said, and this is what the author of the Vindicia is thinking very hard about, perhaps, maybe, in every kingdom, maybe it's part of the way that God set up the world, that in every kingdom there is necessarily some popular magistrate. That is to say, there is some engine, some institution by which the people can express their agency even when the government that normally represents the people becomes tyrannical, becomes evil. Maybe there is built into the structure of things a, a way in which the people always can reassert their identity, can always fulfill the duty that God has given them to do justice. And he, he makes a suggestion. Maybe it has something to do with the diets. And the diets were representative assemblies held in France. And through the diets, the, the structures of society, the warriors, the clergy, and the laborers, to put it in, in basic terms, those who fought, those who prayed, and those who labored, each had a representation. In medieval social thought, you divided society into those three tiers of social activity, fighting, praying, and working. You either did one of, of those things. Those were the three classes of calling. And so when they held representative assemblies, they had three houses, the, the nobility, the church, and more or less everybody, everybody else. And so Calvin says, maybe in the fundamental structure of society and the way in which that's represented through the, the leaders of those various aspects of society, maybe there's always some way that the people have a popular magistrate present whose job it is to correct, overrule uh, tyrants. And if you advance it two slides, one more. Thank you. So today now we see the fulfillment of this promise in the thinking of the Vindiciae. Uh, previously, we've looked at uh, grounds for uh, resistance on different bases than we see today. You saw some suggestion that, well, maybe a, a ruler that becomes evil no longer has any authority. This isn't my favorite theory, but it's a theory that pops up from time to time. Another theory, which I think has much more to commend it, and what we're looking at today is very much the flowering of this theory, is that resistance is appropriate when it's led by someone who is a Romans 13 magistrate, somebody who has office, somebody who can equally claim to be appointed by God as the king who's tyrannizing people. What makes today different? What makes today different is we focus on a new kind of magistrate, the magistrate that Calvin was talking about, the kind of magistrate that is present in every society through the providence of God, the kind of, of magistrate who is necessarily, as part of the creation of any kingdom, present to vindicate the rights of the people against a king. That magistrate is the one who creates the king. The author of, of, of Vindicia says, are kings born? Do people come out of the womb with crowns on their head? Do people come out of the womb bearing scepters? Are there kings running around the world and then peoples are made for those kings? No, of course not. No one is, is born a king. No one is a, a king by a natural essence. Kings are made kings through a social process. And that social process requires that there be a society. That society is what we call the people. The people make the kings. Kings don't make people, people make kings. Which comes first? It's not a chicken and an egg. Uh, we have people and then they make kings. What do we see in the scriptures? Is there a race of, of kings and then peoples form? No, there's the people 
and then they choose a king. The people exist, they have no king but God, and then they choose a king, namely uh, Saul. The people, because they make the king, are superior to the king. So this is the argument of, of Calvin's. Maybe in every society, there's some magistrate who is charged with looking at the king and seeing if he's doing a good job, and if he's not, then he has to be taken out of his office. The suggestion of VCT is, yes, we know the name of that. It's the people acting as a whole. It's the people, when they assert themselves in history, it's the people doing what we read about in the Bible when the people overthrow bad kings. It's the people. This is what we talk about in the U.S. Constitution. We the people, acting through our own authority to create a government. The people, the, the magistrate that Calvin suggested. Why is the people a superior magistrate? It's superior because whoever creates an office has the right to terminate the office, to transform the office, to change the office. Notice this doesn't become true because the, the, the existing king is bad. It doesn't become true when someone becomes tyrannical. It's always true. This is the, the basis for a particular type of democratic spirit. It's always true that the people have responsibilities before God, responsibilities to their fellow man, to ensure the justice of the kingdom they're in. They can never get rid of this responsibility. The, the government flows out of them, and so they're always responsible for it. Not just in times of tyranny, not just in bad times. They're always responsible for the government. Next slide, please. Sorry, one more slide, please. When uh, the author of Vindicia wanted to, to argue this, you, you face a number of problems in this kind of argument. Uh, one of the problems you, you face is you say, well, is there such a thing as a people? Uh, I look out and I see lots of individuals. I see different faces. I see different bodies. Uh, is there any sense in which there's one body when there are many people? Is it, is it really possible for many people to form one body? Is it sensible morally for us to think about a, a real unity between people? This has always been a, a challenge. We call this principle today methodological individualism. It's an important idea in modern academic thought, which is you should deny any real corporate life to peoples. Really. There are just individuals. You can talk sometimes like they're groups, but really there's just a bunch of separated individuals. You can talk about other things, but really they're just separate atoms that can never really become one. Now, we as Christians are opposed to this view, fundamentally. Uh, certainly in the context of our life with Christ, we believe in a corporate existence. In our life in Christ, uh, we say we, and we mean we. When we say we, uh, we don't mean, well, I say we, but really we're just a bunch of undivided, uh, a bunch of divided individuals. You and, and me, we are, are really one. We're really connected in Christ. We're really part of one body in Christ. It's not a, a way of speaking. It's a reality. It's, it's not something which is incidental to who we are. It constitutes our identity. I have special obligations to you. I'm supposed to act towards you, the scriptures teach us, as co-members of my body. We're, we're in the body together. I shouldn't be envious of you, for example, because what's good for you is good for me. I shouldn't look on your pain with indifference because what's bad for you is bad for me. When the toe hurts, the whole body is filled with, with pain. So this methodological individualism is something that we have to attack at some point. It was wonderful today uh, when we were singing, breathe, when we, we shifted from the common lyrics, which say, this is the air I breathe, to this is the air we breathe. 
I'm sure you, you noticed the, the, the difference. You probably stumbled over it with your tongue first, but I hope you stumbled over it with your, your mind as well. We, we can say that God is the air that I breathe, but we can also say that he is the air that we breathe. Uh, we have a unity in Jesus Christ which is real and different than the connection that we have as if we each simply separately worshiped God alone. So the question is, we certainly reject methodological individualism as Christians. We don't think that in all spheres of life, we are just isolated atoms. What about in politics? In politics, is there really any group life of peoples? Is there, is there any way that we, through our, uh, our response to God in history, in making politics, is there any way in which naturally, in, uh, even in the course of sinful politics, we move from being unconnected individuals to be in groups, real groups, groups that have a moral responsibility as a group. At one level, we've we've got to reject methodological individualism even outside the church because we reject it in marriage. Christians are among those in the world who say that the the unity of a man and woman in marriage is not just a, a, a raw contract. It's not something that occurs, a bond between two separate individuals, like two business corporations contracting with one another. But we believe what Christ said, that two people become one flesh, that the the nature of their unity is not merely contractual. The nature of their unity is metaphysical. It's real. There's a, a deeper union between them. What about in other groups? In marriage, perhaps? What about in other groups? What about in families? Right? What about in clans? What about in nations? Well, it's at this point that as Knox turned to the prophecies of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah said, if you rulers are allowed to do this, not only is the curse going to come on you, it's going to come on the whole people who sit by and watch this happen. Uh, they also turn to the, the sacred history of Israel to show that the people can have a corporate agency. So the, one of the passages in your reading that they spend a long time on is this one from 2 Kings chapter uh, 11, verse 17 through 20. And it's important just to take some time with, with the text, which isn't in your reading. Take some time with the text and see what they're thinking here. They're thinking that this text, among many, many others that they discuss, but this text uh, supports the notion that there can be real group agency, that there can be real group duties to God. Certainly, there are individual duties to God. They're not denying that. The question is, in addition to individual duties, are there group duties to God? So here's the the text that they're, they're looking at. Uh, th- this man, uh, Jehoiada, is the high priest of Israel at the time. So I'll just refer to him as the high priest. Uh, the high priest then, after executing Athaliah, Athaliah is a Jezebel-like figure. Uh, after her, her son, who is, she's a daughter of Ahab, the great worshiper of, of Baal, uh, he's killed while off helping the, the, the northern kingdoms battle Syria. And her reaction is to kill everybody else in the royal line and to seize power herself. So she kills off everyone else who could be an heir to the royal line, and she takes power herself. And then the high priest leads a, uh, as a lesser magistrate, leads a coup against her, overthrows her, and has her executed. The high priest, after executing Athaliah, the tyrant, made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people that they would be the Lord's people. So this is how they look at this, this passage. They say, in this passage, there, are, there is not one actor. There are three actors. There's God, there's the king, and there's the people. The critical issue here is the people act. The people are doing things. The people are not 
passive, unable to act except as a king leads them. At this point, there's no king. The old queen has been killed, and the new king has not yet been put on the throne. The, this is the process by which the king is being made into a king and being led to a throne. They have no leadership to do anything except through a lesser magistrate, the high priest. The king acts, the people act. And they think this is really important to understand. They think this points out that the people have the capacity to act. It's not just a group of individuals that act. The author of Vindicia says, no one supposes that every single individual in Israel agreed with this act, or even that every single individual was, was there. They act as a group. There's some sort of group capacity. There's some sort of group dynamic going on here. And interestingly, through this covenant, the king and the people become one thing. The king and the people unite in being the Lord's people. They, they each covenant, they each take on a duty to direct what they become to the Lord. In their mutual orientation to God, they become one new thing. There's another covenant, the covenant between the king and the people. This is a, uh, the way in which this theory uh, resists our, our modern sort of shallowness where we think that there's simply one covenant. Uh, it's the history of the political relations between government and the people. The authors of, of Vindicia say, no, 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 no. Look at what happens in the scriptures. Peoples come into being by wrestling with God. A people's history is always the history we read in Acts of a people being put in a place and being given an opportunity to reach out and maybe to find God. That's the way Paul describes it in his, his speech to the Areopagus. God puts people in boundaries. Why? So that perhaps they'll, they'll reach out and find God. But the first move of, of any national life involves the people's relation to God. And this is why we see in the history of the Bible, uh, the author argues that peoples get judged by God. Sodom and Gomorrah don't just get to live their life ignoring God. They get judged by God. The, the nations of Canaan don't just get to live their life ignoring God. God brings them into judgment. Egypt doesn't get to live its life just ignoring God. God brings it into judgment. God is dealing with the nations and struggling with the nations and continually overthrowing the false gods of the nations. The, the first real nature of the people is formed in their relation to God. And just so, the king, whatever his political relations are, his first and most substantial relationship is his relation to God. This is the, the basis of this constitution that all nations have, this popular magistrate that all nations have. All nations, all rulers, their first relationship is to God. And in an ideal response such as this, the first movement of every heart, whether it's an individual heart like the ruler or the corporate heart of the people, is to covenant with the Lord to be the Lord's people. Now, after that, there's another covenant, the covenant of the king and the people. And it's at this point that the nation begins springing into life. The first thing that happens is the people act. The king has not yet been enthroned. He's not yet a magistrate in the land. The people act as one to go and rip down the, the temples of Baal and to execute the high priest of, of Baal and to restore true worship in the land. And then they go and they place the king on the throne. So again, a number of points here. One. The people show up in this story and in story after story in the scriptures as people who are able to act against tyrants, that are able to act even in a, a period of time when there's no king on the throne, as people who can act together with lesser magistrates to overthrow rulers as they do in this story. 
Well, that's the theory, right? This is the theory that there's always a latent people who can act in this way. What makes it ideal? What makes it good? Well, when the people are in the right relationship to God, when the people are, are trusting in God and following in God and covenanting with God, they're in the right relationship. But the argument of VCT is they're always there. They always have accountability. They always have responsibility. And that's why God judges nations, brings nations into judgment who are idolatrous, who are fighting against him, who are struggling in these ways. The high priest took with him the lesser magistrates who had killed Athaliah and all the people of the land, and together they brought the king down from the temple of the Lord and went into the palace, entering by way of the gate of the guards. The king then took his place on the royal throne, and all the people of the land uh, rejoiced. This is the, the cycle of the story of how Israel's kings are always appointed through popular action. Typically, when they're not overthrowing a tyrant, the nation gathers at Rimna and they bring a king in by acclamation. And it's said that the king begins to be king not when his father dies and he becomes an heir. He becomes a king when the people make him a king by acclamation. This is a, a particularly interesting version of the story because the, the king, before he takes the throne and the people covenant together before the Lord, covenant together as people and king, and then act in a popular capacity. Surely you'd think what should happen is Athaliah should be put on trial, not killed by the lesser magistrate, that the king should clear the land of Baal. But it's not the king who does it. The people take responsibility for purifying the land before they hand the kingdom back over to the king. So here's the, the commentary that we find in, in Vindicia on this, this passage. When King, this is, the, this is the author of Vindicia telling the same story. He doesn't quote the passage that we've just read. He tells the story. When King Joash was crowned, he's the, the young boy they put on the throne. When King Joash was crowned, we read that a covenant was contracted between God, the king, and the people. Or as it is said in another place, this is in the book of Chronicles, between Jehoiada, the high priest, all the people, and the king, that God should be their Lord. In like manner, with respect to another king later on, we read that Josiah and all the people entered into covenants with the Lord. Why is he so obsessed with this point? Because he's going through and arguing against those who say uh, there, there is no popular magistrate by nature, that the Bible teaches us that the people have capacity, always latent, a capacity to enter into covenants with God, that the people have a real agency, that you can say whatever you want, but you can't say this, that the people don't have a real existence, a real moral responsibility, and a real moral capability of entering into covenants with, with God. Oh, one more forward, please. We may gather from these testimonies that in passing these covenants, the high priest did covenant in the name of God in express terms, that the king and people should take order that God might be served purely. And according to his will throughout the whole kingdom of Judah, that the king should so reign that the people were suffered to serve God and held in obedience to his law. What is the, the moral responsibility of a, of a people in their unordered state? You find yourself as a people, you've overthrown a tyrant. What is your obligation? They say the obligation is the same as anyone who finds themselves before God. If you find yourself before God and you don't know what order your life should take, what's the first thing that you should do? The first thing you should do is figure out what is it that's pleasing to God. The first order of my obligation, the first order of my moral life is not to satisfy myself. The first order of my moral life is to say, who made me, who sustains me, who commands me with authority, how can I please him? 
And he says that's the exact same moral order for people. The first thing that a people has to do is satisfy themselves. How do they please God? How do they respond to God in the graces that he's given them, in the land he's given them, in the way he's sustained them? How do we respond to God in a way that is pure and right and pleasing? And I think this is a, a very beautiful piece of political theology in, in, in VCT. It's a very beautiful summary of sacred history. Thus the people should so obey the king as their obedience should have principal relation to God. His, his, his point here is, is actually really simple. The first covenant that you make the first sense of your moral obligation is your obligation to please God. It's like akin to what Jesus says. Two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And there's a second one, and it's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The, these two things have an ordering. One comes first, one comes second. Our order to God comes first. Our giving of ourselves fully to God comes first. And you might say, what's left over? If I've given everything I have to God, how can there be any other moral duty? And yet the answer is, it's like the first. The second is like the first. In what way is it like it? There's a, a likeness between honoring God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and loving your neighbor as yourself. It's the same thing. If you truly give yourself to God, you give yourself to justice for your neighbor. This is the, the teaching of, of Scripture. But if you try to do it in the opposite way, if you try to establish justice between men first and give yourself fully to that, and then say what's left over for God, you find that the solution doesn't work as elegantly. Those who have devoted themselves purely to justice among men creating beautiful ideas of equality of property and the withering away of law and the suppression of the state and its creation of a kind of worldly heaven on earth in the communist vision of things, we find out that they, in the end, have no room for God and they have no room for man. This is the vision of, of VCT, the, the fundamental vision. And it should be our fundamental vision for, for ethics, for all human relations, for all theories of justice in every way. Whatever you're doing, you should do it so that your principal relation is with God. We should understand politics always as, as this. It's something that we do first in relation to God that creates obligations for us with respect to our neighbors. In politics, we first covenant with the king and with God. It's after that. It's as an expression of that covenant that we form purely human relations. I always come back to this, this passage in, in 1 Peter 2.13. But it's an important passage for the author of Indicia too. We don't just submit ourselves to every authority. We, we don't do it uh, just because they punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. Rulers do those things. It's wonderful. It's great that rulers punish wrongdoers and commend those who do right. But that's not why we're told to submit to God. Uh, it, excuse me, to submit to those rulers. We submit to the rulers for the Lord's sake. Vindicia is, is interested in saying, what we're doing in rebelling is not fundamentally about responding to evil. It's not about tit for tat. It's not about uh, a, a kind of retribution. It, it's not a, a manifestation of a, a special occurrence in the presence of evil. We always have in our relationship to God an identity as a people and responsibilities for justice. We usually fulfill those by turning over the duty to the ruler. We make a covenant with a ruler. They say, you and I, we are all standing before God. You, the king, we, the people, we're all standing before God. We all know what our duty of service is to God. We all know what it means to be pleasing to him and loving to our neighbors. We need you. 
you king, to fulfill these duties, we turn over that responsibility to you. But at every moment of political existence, the king who we obey, we're obeying not because the king scares us, not because we're afraid of the king, not even because we want to see bad guys put to death and good guys commended. We're obeying it because we have first made a covenant with the Lord. We are obeying the ruler because we have made a covenant with him as a response to our covenant with God. Thus the people should so obey the king as their obedience should have principal relation to God. This is a great thing for you to, to ask yourself. This is where you get to the, the unity of a theory of martyrdom, a theory of resistance, a theory of obedience to law, a theory of disobedience to law. How can you have a one relationship? How can you have a, there be one thing that you're doing where you participate both in the glorious life of the martyrs and in the glorious life of those who have rightfully stood up and protected people from injustice uh, in situations like the execution of Athalia? How can you participate in the grand sweep of all the Bible's narratives. Sometimes they involve insurrection. Many times they involve dying as a martyr. How can all of those things be united in one spiritual life? And the author of Vindicius says, well, it's because in whatever we do, our principal relationship is to God. Our principal relationship is to God, and that can be manifested in two kinds of relationship to men depending on whether they are fulfilling their covenant that they've made to be loving and serving or they're in disobedience to it. The, the theory of Indicia is certainly a theory of resistance, but it's a magnificent uh, display of the fundamental Christian drive to the truth in God that while they're under all the pressure of persecution, the author of Vindicia wants to produce a theory which points to our principal relationship to God rather than principally serving ourselves, even principally serving ourselves to escape injustice. The purpose of resistance isn't principally even to help me escape from injustice. It isn't principally even to help other people escape from injustice. We do all those things, but why? We do all those things, he say, because our principal relationship uh, is with God. So if, you, uh, if you're interested in this subject, next slide, please. Uh, one thing you might ask is, well, how do the people act? And the, the author of Indicia in your reading says, how can this many-headed beast act? A three-headed beast can't walk straight. Uh, how could a, a beast with as many heads as the people, how could it act straight? And this is where you get a new vision of the theory of lesser magistrates. Before the magistrates intervened, they were kind of rogue government agents that intervened between the higher ruler and an attacked people. But now the, the, the lesser magistrates show up as the kind of organic features that make a people a people. And is, as VCT uses this uh, account, if you go back in 2 Kings and read about how the high priest conspired to bring about the execution of the tyrant, uh, the story is, is very interesting. You should read. I'm not going to read through, uh, through all of this, although you're, you're free to read as I'm, I'm talking here. Uh, Athalia begins her, her reign of, of tyranny. And the, the first act of resistance is a nurse hides the, the last remaining member of the royal, the royal family. Am I on the right page there? Go back. I'm sorry, I was on the right page. That's great. Once she begins the, the tyranny, uh, the first act of resistance is to hide the, the king. Next slide, please. And then in the seventh year of her, ruin, of her reign, the high priest launches a conspiracy among government officials to bring about her execution. Uh, he's the high priest. He summons basically all the leaders of the Levites to meet with him, and they conspire to take the weapons out of the temple 
and use them in a plot against the, the queen. It's very important at this point. They're doing this all secretly. They're binding themselves by a, a secret oath to assassinate the, uh, the queen. The, the, the features of this, of this conspiracy uh, involve them uh, basically bringing, smuggling the, the king to the temple, and then they're going to present him to the public as a, a possible heir, and they're counting on the queen running in and uh, making herself vulnerable, which is what she does. And if you, the next slide. So they bring out the, the heir, they put a crown on him, they say, long live the king. The queen runs out, uh, sees what's happening. She yells, treason, treason. The high priest says, don't kill her in the temple. Kind of usher her out of the temple grounds. They, they usher her out and they, they put her uh, to death. They seize her as she enters the palace grounds and is, is put to death. And this then is when the, the covenant uh, follows. And then the same group of, uh, of lesser magistrates are the leaders in the, uh, the people's work against the, the temple of, of Baal. And here's the commentary of VCT describing this. When we speak of all the people acting, we understand that the people act against a king not as an unordered mass of individuals. This is the, the idea of, of methodological individualism, that when a group acts, it's just a mob. It's just a crowd. But that's not what our social existence is, is like. Uh, groups act through those who also hold their authority for the people and also order them. So when you see real resistance happening in the world, look at what's going on in, in Hong Kong. It's not just a mob of people who show up. It's a group of people who show up in their churches, in their social clubs, in their university classes. They use the other kinds of order that they have, every kind of order they have outside of the governmental order, to resist the government. You and I don't just exist as individuals. We exist in families. We exist in churches. We exist in clubs. We exist in businesses. We exist in lots and lots of different structures that facilitate our, our group life and identity. This is the new interpretation of the theory of lesser magistrates. That is, for one, through the lesser magistrates who are inferior to the king and whom the people have established as the king's consort in rule. He says, you don't have to exclude lesser magistrates, though. If in Hong Kong, the police force or the army were suddenly to turn against the Chinese government, that would be a great moment in the revolution. That would be a great moment in the effort to overthrow the tyranny. This would be a significant moment when a, a ruler decided to lead and affiliate with the people. And then they tie it into Calvin's suggestion. We understand also the people meeting in representative assembly, the assembly of the states, which is nothing else but an epitome or a brief collection of the kingdom to all, whom all public affairs have special and absolute reference. Such an assembly must be found in all kingdoms when the king is appointed, for the people generally cannot assemble in mass to appoint the king directly. What's the proof? that all modern governments, that all ancient governments, that all of them have to be based on popular action. Because none of them ever get every human being together and then create rulers. They create some kind of popular assembly which then acts on behalf of the people. The people send up representatives. The people ratify those acts of the representatives. There, there must be some action in every state by which this occurs because we know the people don't hand over their political authority uh, in a, a true universal assembly. Next slide. So here's the conclusion of the matter. Uh, after uh, the, the Vindicia Contra Tyrannos was, was published, it essentially never went out of print. It was published in pieces. It was published in its entirety. It was translated from Latin into French. It was translated from French into English. It was translated from Latin into English. It was translated into Spanish. It was translated into Italian. 
was translated into many, many languages. It became a, a classic part of the inheritance of the Western world, and then eventually the entire world, to the theory of popular sovereignty. It gave a birth in a systematic way to the idea, friends, we, we don't just exist as individuals, we're also part of a people, and as part of that people, we have responsibilities. Responsibilities to each other, yes, but also responsibilities to God. Not just also responsibilities to God, the most important responsibilities to God, our first responsibilities to God. You know this, because when you stand as an individual before God, you know you owe things to him first. And so, too, it's true of the people. And it's from this that flows the inalienable rights of the people. It's because they have inalienable duties to God that they have inalienable rights before their government. When Moses goes to, to Pharaoh, he doesn't go and assert the universal declaration of human rights. He doesn't go and say, the people have rights. He goes and says, the people have duties to God, duties to worship God, and they can't do it under your tyranny. This is the, the, the biblical theory of popular sovereignty, that God has made the world, God has made its peoples, just as he's called forth worship and ethical action from every individual, so too he's called it forth from every people in the world. We lie to ourselves. We give in to a lie of Satan if we believe the lie of the state that once there's a government in place, the people no longer have any responsibilities to God. No, VCT says. Look at what happened with Athalia. What we see with Athalia is popular action. How do the people act? Well, they act led by their lesser magistrates. The, the priests, the church was leading, the state was involved. Lesser magistrates led the people in popular action to overthrow the tyrant and to put a, a legitimate heir on the throne. This becomes the, the default position for theories of resistance uh, and uh, overthrows of, of government for malfeasance uh, all the way up through the American Revolution. And the American Revolution is premised on the same uh, basis. We the people. We the people can act. We don't act after there's a government. We the people act to create a government. Do we need a king to create the government? Do we need a king to create the people? No. The people pre-exist and create the government. The great question for the American Constitution, the question that was asked at, at the time, is the, the American Constitution serves as a charter between the people and the king. And that's supposed to be the second of the two covenants, according to VCT. The first covenant you make is a covenant with the, the rulers and God and the people. And an interesting, sad fact about the, the U.S. Constitution is it contains no such covenant. And there are two, then, interpretations that you can make. One is... Of course, the American people made such a covenant. The American people were covenantly oriented toward God. It's a Christian nation. It's a nation oriented towards God. It wasn't expressed in this covenant because it's simply a covenant between the king and the people. The other is that the U.S. Constitution excludes a relation to God. And I have to say, based on the way in which we're spiraling out of control in relation to uh, God, it certainly seems as if uh, there's some, some uh, warning, some uh, frightening aspect to that, that possibility. Keep this with you always. Thus the people should so obey the king as their obedience should have principal relation to God. This is a, a great new founding of resistance theory. This is a, a great new way of, of summarizing a, a, biblical, a set of biblical examples to inspire people. We resist not as a response to evil. We resist as a, a, an ever constant freshening of our relation to God. Whether you're in a time where resistance is owed, martyrdom is owed, obedience is owed, this should be the standard. This should be the measure of your life. If you want to Im improve yourself, ready yourself, prepare yourself for martyrdom or for resistance or for obedience, this is the key to make sure that you have the right relation to God when you relate to rulers. 
not fearing them because they're awesome, not fearing rulers because they can hurt you, not obeying them because they offer you rewards, but obeying them out of, a, of an understanding of how that is a service to the Lord. BCT is a, a magnificent source, a wonderful source, a treasure house of political theology, of legal principles that instruct Christians in how to uh, resist rightly. If you get interested in this, if you get serious about theories of resistance, uh, you simply must consult this classic text uh, on Christian theories of resistance. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, it is our desire, Lord, that our primary relation in all things be to you. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, we don't hesitate to come before you and rely on you, to entrust ourselves to you, whether it be to suffer martyrdom, whether it be to follow you to do justice against a tyrant, or whether it be in the ordinary courses we obey the law and seek to work in it as lawyers. In all these things, Lord, let us have our principal relation to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.